So coming up Sunday on the WWE Network, SummerSlam 2020, live from the Thunderdome. <laughs> the Thunderdome? <laughs> you know, the name is so ridiculous that I actually really enjoy it. And, and that's cool. I appreciate the thought of trying to make the environment and the feel different, and most importantly of all, getting the hell out of the performance center. Well done on that. But of course, Sunday night does bring us SummerSlam, also known as apparently the go-home show for Payback. Can anybody explain to me why Payback is exactly one week after SummerSlam? Like SummerSlam, you would think historically, traditionally, should be where big things start or big things end. The beginning of a story or a culmination of a journey. Not just necessarily another step in the process because we've got to have more content on the network the next week. But nonetheless, here's what it is. It's 2020. What the hell else are you going to expect at this point? I gotta say, admittedly, looking ahead to this, I don't know that there's any one thing that just has me like, ooh and ah, when it comes to this pay-per-view. Uh, but certainly looking forward to at least again having some type of distraction for a few hours on Sunday night. And let's see what we get out of it. In terms of looking at the matches, you've got the Raw Tag Team Championship. You've got Andrade and Garza versus the Street Profits. Personally, to me, I would have rather had this just been uh, Bianca Belair versus Selena Vega. They're the better talents. Hot women. You know, like, especially look at Bianca Belair. And I still understand. Like, I didn't realize that there was such an undercurrent of people that so fundamentally disagree with the notion that she has... Bianca has it factor in Star Pop. I would just sort of thought this was kind of a given, and, and, and apparently it's not. Well, you're wrong, but hey, everybody's entitled to their own thing. Some of you think that Adam Cole has Mega Star written all over him. He does not. But again, we are entitled to our opinions. You'll just be wrong with yours. As far as this match, I have no significant emotional investment one way or another on it. I would wish they would have incorporated the ladies here, and maybe they have, and I just didn't realize it. Maybe they will. I don't know. In terms of just making it a, a six-person tag for the titles, it feels like maybe been the better place to go, but it is what it is. I'm sure we'll get some spots, and that's about it, and I'll be more interested in what's going to go on between Zelina and Bianca Belair than the actual match itself. Uh, then you get to what was a hair versus hair match, but apparently now is a loser leaves WWE match. But is it also a hair versus hair match? Is it one? Is it the other? Is it the both? I don't know. Mandy Rose versus Sonya Deville, who at least at the time of recording this, I believe, are still having their match on Sunday. I believe that SummerSlam match is still happening. I believe. Uh, now, what I certainly am not going to do is criticize this in any way, shape, or form. This is a match that actually has story behind it. This is a match where the characters have history. It makes sense for them to have some type of big culmination and blow-off here, and it deserves to be on the SummerSlam card. And if it was just a hair versus hair match, that certainly would work for me. And I could also think about what it could have meant potentially for Sonya Deville and his, her career to have shaved her head and, you know, do something different, go Molly Holly style or something like that. But uh, the whole thing about the loser leaves WWE match Maybe on the one hand, you feel like you know where this is going and who's going to lose. This is an incredibly tough situation for both of these ladies. To deal with what they just recently had to deal with, and Sonya Deville having to go to court, and just the invasion of privacy, and, and the risk to their personal health and well-being. That's just not cool. And the fact that one or both of them would even be willing to continue to work when they have every reason in the world not to at this point in time, and other people find significantly less reasons to not do their jobs in their respective fields. You know, a ton of respect to both of them. Even if this match sucks on SummerSlam, you can be hard pressed for me to say anything but good things about both of these ladies, because frankly, they deserve it at this point. They've had enough rough enough week or so, they don't need nerds like me piling onto them. And again, the respect factor goes up significantly that clearly shows that they value their job and value what they do and have a passion for what they do. And I really, really respect that. So hats off and respect to both of those ladies. Uh, the United States Championship, MVP versus Apollo Crews. You know, you would think about this as kind of being like a little bit of a spotlight here for Apollo Crews, but the reality is I care so much more about MVP and his group, even though I don't like his group's name. Like MVP has looked really, really good 
to the point where he's easily one of the most interesting things on WWE television right now. That is Raw, SmackDown, NXT does not matter. Like, this is a guy that it feels like to be in some ways is at the peak of his career in his 40s. Like, it's good shit right there. And maybe this is designed to put Apollo Crews over, maybe, and kind of be like, eh, with that. I would rather see MVP actually get the United States Championship back and be able to walk around as champion for a little bit because I think there is inherently more, significantly more mileage for him in that belt if you do it that way. Whereas having Apollo Crews win it just means that he's just going to be wrestling random matches each week on Raw and then defending the belt every pay-per-view like I want more, need more. MVP inherently provides you a lot more flexibility and ability to do just that. Um, you've got two women's championship matches that for some reason we've got to have Asuka in both of them. Like, and admittedly, I'm just kind of getting back into it again after a couple of months away. I'm trying to really figure out why we have to have one woman wrestling for both of the women's championships. Like, do we feel the talent cupboard is that bare? Do we really feel that Asuka is that far superior to any of the other women challengers that you could have potentially had? Like, I'm not really grasping the concept here. And even like when they did the um, beat the clock challenge on SmackDown, of course, Sasha Banks just had to sit there and win via tapping Naomi out. But then Naomi beats Bailey in less time. Like, that just seems ridiculous to me. And it's so often the case with things that involve Sasha Banks. It's just ridiculous. And this whole thing with Bailey and Sasha Banks, I know I've had some of you uh, lash out a little bit about, hey, this is one of the best things that they have on the show. Well, if that's the case, then maybe that speaks to just how bad it's been. And maybe that's because somebody like Charlotte is out. I don't know. You know, like... People that you weren't expecting potentially to be a big part of the show. Becky Lynch is out. Charlotte's out. You haven't gotten Rob Rousey back. You know, like maybe this is the best you got. Maybe it was one of the better things on the show. I think that's more an indictment of the bad than necessarily a credit to their good. Um, but every time I seem to go away for a month or two, I come back and these two are still involved with something. And what is the whole point with this? And is this just going to lead to... Bailey losing her strap, but Sasha keeping hers. Is Shayna Baszler going to get involved? I mean, I am a little morbidly interested to see what they do with both of these matches. Um, but, you know, history would indicate, well, Sasha's the champ in a pay-per-view. She gone. She losing. Which, which you know, I, 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 my understanding is, is that Bailey has to defend the title first. Like, are you going to have Asuka win both? So that way she can unify the titles. So now we're going to treat her like she's a big effing deal. And I'm just, I'm just asking. Uh, perhaps the match that has the most curiosity peaked for me is the street fight with Dominic Mysterio and Seth Rollins. Now let me be completely clear here. The whole structuring of this match should be that Seth Rollins is the professional. Seth Rollins is one of the top guys that they have. Seth Rollins should be able to largely dominate this match this street fight. But because it's a street fight, Mysterio can show his toughness. Dominic can show that he's a guy that can take a hell of a whooping and keep on coming. He That he can get in some good clean shots, get a hook spot or two. Maybe daddy gets involved. But if you have Dominic win this, man, I just don't know why you would. Unless you're really insistent upon pushing him. Like if you really think this is gonna be a thing, but even then, wins should not always equate to proper push. Wins should not always translate to what a guy needs to get over. Now, when you look back and say, well, little Jeff, you would say something about SummerSlam 2010, and you look at the Nexus. No, at that time, at that moment, when you've been billing them as rookies, and they're going against Team WWE with guys like Edge and Jericho, and especially Cena on that team, yes, Wade Barrett needed to win that. The Nexus needed to win that, period. Different situation, different set of circumstances, different consequences for the horrendous decision that was made. Here, I feel like... You run the risk of potentially turning people against Dominic before they really need to be turned against him if you haven't beat Seth Rollins. I think Seth Rollins is overrated garbage, mind you. But at the same point in time, he's the established guy. He should not be doing any type of job here whatsoever, and I will defend him on that for damn sure. You know, especially when he's got somebody like a Buddy Murphy in his corner. You know, maybe it's at risk. Maybe there are a moment or two of hope spots, as I referenced earlier. Uh, but this should be about 
establishing Dominic Mysterio as legitimate, but not that level of legitimate. It should be, he takes a beating, gets in some stuff, and Seth Rollins wins. That's the way I feel like it should be done here. And ironically, when we get to the two world title matches for the men, like these are two matches to me that if you had a company that did a better job with writing, storytelling, these matches should be really great. At least the buildup and the feel and the anticipation for them at a big four paper. Like on paper, you would look at it and you would say, The Fiend versus Braun Strowman feels like a big four pay per view world title match in today's WWE world. Randy Orton versus Drew McIntyre feels like a big four WWE pay per view world title match in this day and age. In theory, these matches should both have something going for them. I wonder what role this stupid retribution angle is going to play in this and whether it's going to cost one or it's going to come up in one or both of these world title matches. Um, I wonder if you're getting ready to do the double turn with The Fiend and Strowman, which certainly wouldn't hurt my feelings, but how would that work? And are they really going to, now that they finally put the belt on Braun way too damn late, are they now just going to take it back off and put it right back on The Fiend? I also don't know that that needs to happen. In terms of the WWE Championship, you know, you, you've done a lot again. You served up Ric Flair uh, at the expense of Randy Orton. It would be really weird if you put him back in this spot that you didn't culminate that by having him beat Drew at SummerSlam because there was still more mileage there, and especially seeing as how you just have another pay-per-view coming up the next day and week. Like, is that a, a co-branded pay-per-view like everybody's on there? It's just weird. Like, it makes me wonder if we're going to get some really squirrely finishes come Sunday or some finishes that seem definitive on Sunday, but then throughout the course of the week's television and then payback ultimately are not. I don't really know. If I had to guess, Orton's winning that strap and Strowman's retaining? Maybe? Or maybe one of these two finishes in a no finish because of something like the Retribution's involvement? I don't really know. Um, yeah, I, I look at this and... I don't see a ton of opportunity where I have a lot of confidence that the WWE is going to be incredibly creative with what they do here on Sunday, nor necessarily does it automatically appeal that if you give the opportunity for the WWE to be creative, um, that they would necessarily come through. They might be able to do some of the like theatrical style type of pre-tape matches well, but you know I'm talking about creativity from a, a pure storytelling, pure booking and writing standpoint. I, I just... I believe it when I see it. I am again, though, at least looking forward to having the positive distraction on Sunday night and looking forward to coming on here after the show and reviewing it for all of you. How about that? So let me know what you think is going to happen at SummerSlam Sunday night. Who you think is going to win? Who should win? Um, who should get buried? Uh, and just kind of your general expectations. Remember, this is OTR Essential, not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. I'll see you Sunday night, I guess.